Hello, and welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Pipe Workshop at the Bedrosian Center here in the Price School at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Pipe Collaborative. And our workshop speaker today is Christina Kinane. Christina is an assistant professor of political science and a resident fellow in the Institute of Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. She studies American political institutions and their role in policymaking under separation of powers. Christina's presentation today is Vacancy Politics. It is based on her current book manuscript, same title, in which she investigates how presidents strategically use vacancies in their appointments that require Senate confirmation to promote their policy priorities. Following Christina's presentation, we'll have a formal discussant, Rachel Augustine Potter, who is a professor at the University of Virginia. During Christina's talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or the Q&A box, or use the raise hand feature. I'll be monitoring questions and determining if they need to be asked immediately or can wait until the end. And without further ado, I give you Christina Kane. Thank you. Thank you again so much, Jeff, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, yes, I am very excited uh, to speak uh, uh, to talk and 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 think through um, with all of you today about this book project that I'm working on uh, entitled Vacancy Politics, which examines in depth uh, what the politics of vacancies in presidential appointments are, a question that I actually began to answer in my recent paper published in the American Political Science Review entitled Control Without Confirmation, uh, The Politics of Vacancies in Presidential Appointments. Now, 2020 uh, certainly was a year of, of just absolute crazy, um, but it did give us a few memes that are that were pretty popular. And, and if we were to go with the popular meme of how it started versus how it's going, we were to ask how it started when it comes to presidential power to appoint the 1,200 or so individuals who are delegated the authority to to direct regulation, implementation, and enforcement, who lead much of the government's policymaking efforts, Alexander Hamilton actually gives us a perfect answer to how it started uh, for the intention of uh, Senate confirmation. And specifically, uh, writing in, uh, in the 1700s in the Federalist Papers, Federal 17, Federalist 76, he says, the true test of a good government is its aptitude and tendency to produce a good administration. The necessity of Senate concurrence would be an excellent check upon a spirit of favoritism in the president and would tend greatly to prevent the appointment of unfit characters from state prejudice, from family connection, from personal attachment, or from a view of popularity. And in addition, Hamilton writes, to this, it would be an efficacious source of stability in the administration. And that is really uh, you know, orienting us towards this assumption that separation of, of, that goes along with our separation of powers framework of government, that executives are constrained by the need for legislative approval when placing agents in unelected office. So understandably then, scholars have largely considered vacancies a footnote, a byproduct uh, of changes in an administration, the inadvertent failure to find a nominee or senatorial delays in confirmation. And so existing theories of appointments focus on the choice of nominee, often in terms of ideological alignment, loyalty, or competence. They offer reasons, say, for instance, uh, President Trump would select Ryan Zinke for Secretary of the Interior here on the left in this picture. Or they focus on the Senate's role post-nomination. And in doing so, existing theories of politi in political science implicitly assume that presidents will always nominate when presidents, in fact, do not. And more recently, if we're continuing that, that popular 2020 mean, if we were to ask how it's going after four years of the Trump administration, we'd find a pretty stark contrast to Hamilton's ideal, particularly since at the halfway point of his term, with a Republican majority Senate, 30% of presidential appointments that require Senate confirmation in the Trump administration were vacant. And more than half of those vacancies did not have a nominee awaiting confirmation. But that doesn't mean that these positions are empty. 
when they don't have a confirmed appointee. Our conventional definition of vacancies has left it to mean simply that they are PAS positions without a confirmed appointee. And certainly presidents can leave these empty, but they can also appoint who they want outside of the formal nomination process, what we term interim appointees. Yet our current conceptualization of vacancies doesn't account for this. Instead, it indicates simply that the positions do not have a Senate confirmed appointee. And so importantly, these interim appointees, if they are filling the position, they're doing so exercising the authorities, duties, and powers of that position without having undergone Senate confirmation. And offering, as Trump affectionately suggested in this interview with Face the Nation, the considerable amount of flexibility for the president. In fact, Trump started 2019 with six of the 24 cabinet level positions without a Senate confirmed appointee, but filled with an interim appointee. Interims here, like David Bernhardt, who's uh, on the left, secretary, uh, or acting secretary, rather, of uh, the Department of the Interior, or Patrick Shanahan here on the right, acting secretary of the defense. And these are options that presidents can and do use in the absence of a Senate-confirmed appointee. But we're only now starting to examine when, and more importantly, why they do. And we're really only taking notice uh, 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 because of work that myself I have done and also uh, and Joseph O'Connell, which to plug a, a panel that we're doing tomorrow at this same time. Um, basically, what we have been missing uh, uh, is the fact that these vacancies have been filled with interim appointees or left empty at a varying rate across years, time, and administrations. And it's surprising because it's not a recent trend. As you can see from the original data here that I collected um, here, uh, the gray line represents the uh, uh, typical definition of a vacancy with no confirmed appointee. The orange line is the percentage of these PAS positions filled by an interim appointee, and the blue line are those left empty. And as you can see from Carter to Obama, PIS positions were vacant on average 25% of the time, and interim appointees filled nearly half of those vacancies across administrations. And, 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 and more specifically, they're filling more than 10% of PIS positions on average. But as you can see, this varies by year, by administration, and even by department. And more importantly, I'll get into this data as a part of uh, the, the, when I walk through uh, the article that is recently published in the APSR, this is the first of its kind, but it is limited because this provides us only a snapshot. It is a yearly time step in each year, which is a shortcoming of this work and one that I'm overcoming with my larger book project, Vacancy Politics, in which I collected a large scale continuous data set covering the same period. So in vacancy politics, I examine in depth how and why presidents use vacancies in their top appointments and the implications of those choices for separations of powers. Through case studies and analysis of, of an original continuous data set that I just spoke of, I take a look at vacancies, appointments, nominations across 15 executive departments from 1977 to 2021 to learn a little bit more and try and answer these specific questions. First, why do presidents choose to leave certain positions vacant while seeking the Senate's advice and consent for others? Why do presidents leave certain vacant positions empty while filling others with interim appointees? And how do these strategic vacancies affect the dynamics of the formal confirmation process? Ultimately, in this, in this book project that I am um, uh, working on and in the paper, uh, Control Without Confirmation, I argue that vacancies in appointments that require Senate confirmation are calculated choices that presidents make within their larger nomination strategies to advance their policy priorities. So today I'm going to talk first about the mechanics of vacancies to give everyone a sense and background as to how these function, and then lay out very briefly the theory of vacancies that I've constructed, and then I will present data and findings from uh, the article, and which form ultimately the kernel of this larger book enterprise, and I'll introduce the larger path that the manuscript is taking. 
And so I'll go through the control without confirmation, and then I'll go through parts of the Vacancies Politics uh, book project, examining the president's advantage in agency appointments, uh, how the Senate works into this process, and how they potentially are relinquishing consent by engaging in confirmation delay when the positions are filled with actings what exactly these actings are engaging in when they are in their positions, what policy implications there are for them. And then I'll dive a little bit into the Trump acting administration. So as I mentioned earlier, this starts by recognizing that presidents can leave positions empty, but they can fill these positions with people that they want outside of the formal nomination confirmation process. So consider, for instance, the resignation of Neil Korns. On January 19th, 2017, as the Obama administration was drawing to a close, as most Senate-confirmed appointees will do during an a transition from one administration to the other, Korns stepped down uh, as Senate-confirmed director of the Bureau of Land Management in the Department of the Interior. His departure created what would be a four-year vacancy spanning the entire Trump administration in a critical position that is responsible for managing more than 245 million surface acres of public land, about 12% of the nation's land mass, and is charged with determining the use of that land for things like energy development, uh, livestock grazing, uh, cultural or, or recreation and timber harvesting, while also ensuring a natural, cultural and historic resources that are on these lands are maintained both for present use and for future use. Yet, for nearly three and a half years, Trump did not submit a nominee for Senate confirmation, even though the Republicans controlled the Senate. Instead, he relied on five different interim appointees. Kristen Bale from January to March 2017, Michael Ned from March to November 2017, Brian Steed from November 2017 to May 2019, Casey Hammond from May 2019 to July 2019, and then finally, William Perry Pendley, who was at the time Deputy Director of Policy and Programs, who assumed those uh, duties as the Acting Director of BLM on July 29th, 2019. So the person responsible for the nation's backstop against what we would consider a tragedy of the commons, supporting wildlife and habitat conservation for more than 3,000 species, maintaining recreation access for more than 62 million annual visitors, all while generating over $2 billion in revenue from oil and gas. That individual for the entire Trump administration was not a confirmed appointee, but rather an interim appointee. And so while Trump was more than forthcoming in his affinity for acting appointees, and he relied on them more than his predecessors, acting, filling these top positions for a considerable amount of time is actually not that unprecedented. In fact, it's almost baked into the mechanics of vacancies themselves. So what do I mean by that? Well, to give you a very brief background on the procedural regimes that are governing vacancies, and I'm happy to take questions in Q&A, there are generally five or so procedural regimes that are governing vacancies in these PAS positions. First, uh, there's the Vacancies Act of 1898, which was passed um, after recognizing that the Article II uh, uh, of the Constitution uh, Appointments Clause, which demands Senate consent uh, to these very important principal officers, to whom Congress will ultimately delegate a considerable amount of power to, Con that confirmation that's required doesn't happen instantaneously. In fact, there's often delay. And so Congress offered the president the ability to fill these positions on an interim basis for just 30 days. That 30-day time period stayed until 1988 when Congress extended it to 120 days with the Presidential Transition Effectiveness Act. And it was 120 days until the Federal Vacancies Reform Act, or the FBRA, which covers most vacancies that we are experiencing right now, passed in 1998. The fourth and fifth regimes are actually more the absence uh, of these uh, governing statutes. 
Uh, oftentimes, the originating statutes of agencies or sub-agencies in specific positions will identify how those positions are to be filled on an interim basis. There's succession orders that are passed by department heads. There's sub-delegation. And then as that fifth procedural regime, there are no interims allowed for those PAS positions on independent regulatory commissions, so commissioners of, of say, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. Okay. So a little bit more on the current procedural regime, the FVRA. And this is where it gets really interesting. In 1998, Congress extended the time period to which an initial interim appointment could occur to 210 days, upwards of 300 days if that vacancy happens close to the transition at inauguration. However, this restriction is suspended if the first nomination is pending in the Senate. If the Senate decides to reject, withdraw, or return that nomination, or the president decides to withdraw the nomination, that 210-day clock starts again for the interim. It's then suspended again if a second nominee is pending. Should the Senate move on that nomination or the president withdraw it, that clock starts for yet another 210 days. So if you're keeping track at home, there's a total potential interim appointment of upwards of 720 days or potentially even indefinitely. Okay. So now I ho hopefully I have thoroughly convinced you that the absence of a Senate confirmed appointee does not mean an empty seat. And interim appointees are clearly valuable and, and, and viable alternatives for the president's personnel choices. And that presidents might not even pursue the formal route of Senate confirmation. But importantly, it's only when we correct our conceptualization of vacancies to identify these two very different realities that we can rethink how they factor into the strategic considerations of presidents and the Senate when they're faced with an appointment opportunity. And so to do that, I've modeled vacancies explicitly taking into account both types of vacancies as strategic choices that offer presidents the opportunity to pursue diverging policy goals. My theory formalizes the president's choice to fill a position in an interbranch bargaining context, one that leverages the Senate's uh, 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 veto on a nomination and the president's power to choose not to submit one in the first place. And so even though I don't have time to go through the parts of the model, I do want to point out that my model widens our lens to see more than just the sub game of nomination confirmation that our current theories of appointments focus on to see a more accurate and complete representation of the appointments process. And in doing so, we also need to move beyond our traditional focus on the appointee, the individual human, and consider how the position itself filled or unfilled can deliver benefits or utility to the president or the Senate. And so to do that, I argue, we need to think about the capacity of the position to advance policy priorities. And so a central component of my model that drives the Senate's choice to confirm and the president's choice to appoint in what is what I've termed position value. And specifically position value is a combination of two variables, position capacity and policy priorities. And I'll get into those in just a second. But what this model does is it ultimately takes us back to the decision the president makes when first presented with a vacancy, and that is to fill it immediately or not. And should the president choose to fill the position immediately with an interim or not fill the position immediately with the interim, he's then faced with another decision on whether or not to submit a nominee for Senate confirmation or not. And it's only when the president chooses to submit a nominee to the Senate, unilaterally chooses this as it is, that the Senate becomes involved in this process. Okay. So as I mentioned, in order to back away from the individual human, the appointee, and think about the position, I've created this uh, concept of position value, that it's the capacity of the position to control policy and and agency actions and advance a player's priorities to either expand, contract, or neutrally maintain the status quo policy actions and policy reach of that agency. 
Now within uh, the larger model, and I'm happy to go over this in Q&A, but I just don't have time to get into it. There's a variety of other parameters that are included in the larger utility functions that govern these choices between that the president and the Senate make. And these are appointee effectiveness, that is the ability of a selected appointee to deliver that full value of the position, whether the position is filled, and this multiplier is to recognize that a human sitting in a seat is is physically and visibly different than an empty seat. And then a, a, uh, a parameter for the anticipated degree of oversight. And that is the Senate imposed constraint that it comes from confirmation when a permanent appointee is gone through the confirmation process and might it might limit or amplify their ability to deliver the full value of the position to the president. So each of these goes into this larger generalized utility function that each player receives some payoff from either filling the position immediately, filling it in the long term. And then if the president decides to submit a nominee for the Senate, there's a confirmation process that is costly. And so I also uh, include a bargaining cost in that utility function. And so solving this uh, equilibrium, uh, we end up with a certain amount of empirical implications that are drawn out of this model. Um, it's sequential and straightforward and uh, solved through backwards induction. And I'm happy to go over that in Q&A. So the game itself starts, as I said, with a, an empty position that is presented to the president. He chooses either to fill the position with an interim and not nominate, fill with an interim and nominate, not fill the position with an interim and nominate, or do neither of those things and therefore lead to an empty position. Should the president choose to not nominate, the game ends with either an interim appointee or an empty position. And should the president choose to nominate, the Senate then chooses a strategy of either confirm or not confirm. And again, um, uh, this main concept that kind of comes in and wraps the central component of this model and is ultimately at the heart of my larger theory is this idea of position value, which is composed of position capacity and policy priorities. And very quickly, I will go through these. Again, happy to answer questions in the Q&A. So the theoretical concept of position capacity is that positions themselves are afforded responsibilities and authority that either create high capacity to impact agency actions that are policy making or a low capacity to do that. So the low policy control capacity are administrative or routine. They are focused on departmental operations or information gathering. This is contrasting to the high policy policy control capacity positions, which focus on policy implementation activities, things like promulgating rules, adjudicating uh, disagreements or, or cases, investigations, and they have the jurisdiction and authority to influence policy outcomes. And ultimately, because this theory leads to an empirical analysis, there's an empirical measurement that goes along with these. And so in order to do that, uh, or in order to represent that here, these would be assistant secretaries of administration, communication or public affairs, or various research positions that don't have grant making or policy recommendation uh, responsibilities associated with them. Those would be the low uh, uh, capacity positions as opposed to the high capacity positions, which are agency heads, general counsels, inspectors general, deputy and assistant secretaries with jurisdiction and responsibilities for direction of policy and implementation itself. Now, as I mentioned, there's two components to position value, position capacity, and then policy priorities. And so here, this is the priority of the president or the Senate to increase the reach of an agency's policymaking activities, to maintain the status quo, or to decrease that reach in activities. So either expansion, neutral, or contraction priorities. And empirically, these are measured through budget requests and budget uh, uh, authorizations. And so so to uh, identify expansion priorities for a specific department for the president, I measure this uh, as uh, the president's budget request for that fiscal year uh, compared to an average of the previous two fiscal year's budget authorities. And comparing this to uh, the uh, uh, inflation rate that would be necessary to maintain uh, that same level of funding, uh, those same levels of activities given inflation. So 
neutral would be maintaining that same level of inflation within that range, uh, or sorry, that same level of funding within the range of inflation. And uh, contraction priorities are budget requests that decrease from the previous, from the average of the two previous years' budget authorities. All in all, uh, uh, you combine position priority and, um, uh, sorry, policy priority and position capacity to create this position value so that each position has a particular capacity to advance policy priorities and the president or the Senate actually uh, uh, prioritizes the actions of that agency. So low value positions are those with low capacity to change agency actions or if the president or the Senate is neutral to those agency actions. And to make the uh, implications of this theory as stark as possible, high value positions are only such that they have a high capacity to advance policy priorities and the actor prioritizes the department itself, either to contract or expand uh, the agency actions of that department. So combining the Senate strategies and the president's strategies in this larger uh, uh, game, as I mentioned, we end up with certain outcomes, uh, either that uh, there's an interim and a permanent filling the position in, in, uh, concess in consecutive nature, an interim only, a permanent only, or an empty position. And these result from the combination of the president's strategies in period one to either fill immediately or not, and then to submit a nominee or not, and then the Senate strategies to confirm or not confirm. And from this, these uh, uh, solving from the equilibrium, we can uh, achieve some, we can attain some empirical implications and derive some hypotheses as to what we would expect to observe given the assumptions of the theory. And so there are four hypotheses that are derived. First, the empty position hypothesis that a president is more likely to leave high value positions empty when prioritizing policy contraction. The interim appointee hypothesis, a president is always immediately going to fill low value positions with interims and is more likely to fill high value positions when prioritizing policy expansion. The permanent appointee hypothesis that confirmed appointees are more likely in these high value positions when the president prioritizes expansion and the Senate does not prioritize contraction. So either has neutral priorities or also prioritizes expansion. And lastly, that the president will not submit a nominee for confirmation without also appointing an interim appointee. Now to, to test these uh, uh, hypotheses in the uh, paper control without confirmation, I gathered an original data set that was a part of my dissertation research for um, uh, my dissertation project. And uh, to do that, I, I had to gather for position capacity, policy priorities, and also position value, all of these major concepts at the heart of my model. To uh, identify a position's capacity, I relied on annual editions of the US government manual, which lists the jurisdictions and authorities and responsibilities of each of the PAS positions. I then uh, uh, turned to budget data in order to uh, calculate policy priorities, as I, I mentioned in that empirical um, section of, of how I calculated those policy priorities. I relied on the fiscal year editions of the budget of the United States, which are archived by Fraser, And I combined these to assign a position value to each position as either high value expansion, high value contraction, or low value for the president and the Senate from Carter through the end of Obama. Now that is the independent variable of interest. And for our dependent excuse me, dependent variable of interest, I needed to be able to collect information on the position status to identify whether the position was empty, in, filled with an interim, or filled with a permanent appointee. And to do this, I collected a large scale original data set using archived versions uh, or editions of the government policy and supporting positions, the Plum Book, the uh, archived editions of the US government manual, reported vacancies to the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, and scraped nominations data from uh, congress.gov. And what this represents are yearly time steps 
when the position, uh, uh, sorry, when the uh, archived editions of the government manual is published, they identify whether the position is filled with an interim, filled with a permanent appointee, or left empty at the time of publication. So what I have here are yearly time steps um, as to whether that what that position status is from 1977 to 2016, and that's a total of 11,043 observations. Okay, so now to test that those, those, those first two hypotheses and start to explain position status with this position value, I'm going to show you first some cross-tabulated distributions just to, to kind of offer some, some um, uh, proof that this is actually, these patterns are bearing out. And then for those in the, in the audience who are interested in the parametric models, I estimated likelihood models uh, of these position status, uh, both with the full set and then also separated in the context context of the FBRA. So here, importantly, to show the uh, to, to show the importance of this key implication of differentiating between empty positions and interim appointees. Here in the red are the distribution of vacancies and permanent appointees across the three categories of position value for the president. You can see that it's about 20% across the entire time period. And you can't statistically di differentiate between any of these distributions. But when we identify empty positions versus interim appointees, this reveals a starker uh, pattern here and one that is uh, anticipated by my theory, that interim appointees would be at a higher percentage, uh, occupy a higher percentage of positions uh, under high value expansion. And here we have a higher percentage of PIS positions filled with interim appointees in, under that category that high value contraction would lead to higher percentages of empty positions. And again, we see that, although just slightly. And then low value, again, we would, we would expect to see uh, higher percentages of interim appointees in those categories. And these patterns are bearing out without controlling for any other uh, parts of the political process. These patterns are bearing out in the data. And it's bearing out even more, uh, a little bit starker, when we look just at, at the distribution across just vacant positions. Christina, could I, could I yeah. break in here with, uh, Ann O'Connell asks a, uh, yes. what, what I think is a clarifying question. I don't know if you can, you can see the Q and A there. Oh. Uh, what percentage of vacant, quote unquote, vacant jobs does the president actually have a choice to fill with huh. an interim appointee or leave with no one? That's a really good question. And I think that gets to, um, unfortunately, I can't seem to get the, the uh, oh, okay, so I see the Q&A. Um, oh, that's a long question. <laughs> um, so uh, essentially, I don't have that percentage quite yet for you. I wish I did. Um, but what, uh, what I think you're pointing to is the fact that uh, first assistants are automatically elevated to be the acting uh, appointee in that position. However, presidents could leave those first assistant positions empty and in doing so would then not have someone available to automatically step in as the acting appointee. Okay, so um, uh, in order to engage in a, a parametric analysis to, to bring out some statistical inference um, rather than that just those cross tabulated distributions, I estimated multinomial probit regressions first with the full set of uh, the three category position status being the dep dependent variable, several variables of interest, the president's position value and, and Congress position, position value and then the interaction thereof, as well as several important controls, whether the, the administration is established, whether the president is facing a co-partisan Senate, what procedural regime the time period is in, and then department and administration fixed effects as well. And so from this analysis, we can see that um, there's at least some, uh, there's, there's, there's good support for the interim appointee hypothesis, although not particularly any support for the empty position hypothesis. And that is, as expected, we see higher predicted probabilities of interim appointees, this darker line here, these are the uh, adjusted predicted probabilities with their confidence intervals, the darker line representing those um, estimated for interim appointees, the lighter gray representing those for empty positions. And we can see that the pattern as expected and as, as um, uh, uh, predicted by my model is bearing out in the data, but it is interesting that it's not bearing out for empty positions within this high value contraction uh, category. 
However, when we um, uh, uh, estimate these predicted probabilities across the procedural regimes, we get a really stark and very interesting pattern that emerges. And that is that there appears to be a difference in how uh, these positions are playing out with regard to the position, uh, with, sorry, with regard to the procedural regime that is governing them. And so uh, we have here this estimated predicted probability across the procedural regimes that gives us a reason to investigate whether or not these patterns are different during the pre-FERA period versus the post-FERA period. So I estimated the same multinomial uh, uh, logic or probe it on the data, first set being pre-FERA and then uh, the second set being post-FERA. And here are the adjusted predicted probabilities of those uh, 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 model estimates. And here we can see a really interesting pattern that in the pre-FERA period, the expected, uh, 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 the theoretical expectation that empty appoint, uh, positions would be more likely in high value contraction positions uh, for the president's position value category bears out in the pre-FERA period, but then not in the post-FERA period. However, in that post period, there's significantly higher predicted probabilities of interims across the board. So this is what is captured in this single time step data. And, and in order to really engage with these questions in the larger book manuscript, I, uh, I sought to collect continuous data that would allow a more fine grained analysis of exactly what's going on here. Building a continuous data set of the statuses of all PIS positions in the 15 executive departments of the administrations from Carter to Obama, is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> my excellent team of research assistants um, and I, uh, here, my research assistants here at Yale, scoured presidential archives, the federal register, the congressional record, federal court filings, archived appearances on C-SPAN, digital archives of departmental websites, press releases, pre uh, professional resumes, obituaries, LinkedIn profiles, um, various biographic exposés and investigative news reports to fill in the gaps from uh, the official uh, records uh, supplied by OPM um, through a FOIA request for myself and then also so very generously uh, 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 shared by Anne Joseph O'Connell who just asked that previous question. Um, as well as GAO vacancy records to construct uh, a continuous data set covering all of these sets, over 8,200 unique individual point T observations, and it ends up being about 175,000 position months that we're able to identify whether the position is empty, filled with an interim appointee, a permanent appointee, and then whether a nominee is awaiting Senate confirmation during that time period. So for the, to give a preview of the Department of the Interior, the data at the heart um, uh, of this larger continuous data set, here's an example with the Department of the Interior. So going back through uh, uh, Carter, we can see that there has been variation, not only in the number, the total number of confirmed appointees at Interior, the total number of interim appointees, but then also the days that they've served, how long they've, uh, they've been in that position, either in a, an official permanent status or in an official interim status. Now, um, following the wonderful example from Ann Joseph O'Connell in her, in her um, uh, uh, Columbia Law Review piece, I also differentiated between empty positions and those that were performing the duties and authorities of the position without actually having the acting capacity. And for those, I've identified them in the Trump administration for that effect. And so here we can see a few things kind of stand out with regard to Trump versus the previous administrations. First, Trump is by far the smallest number of confirmed appointees uh, of the previous seven administrations. Not only that, but they served the least amount of time. Now, even with the four years instead of eight years of a two term, we still see that interim appointees at the uh, Department of the Interior served more than W's entire eight year term, 
uh, w, uh, George W. Bush's entire eight-year term, Clinton's entire eight-year term, and Reagan's entire eight-year term. And so this is really giving us a sense of just how dramatic that increase of interim appointees is. Now, granted, it's just for the interim, or sorry, just for the Department of the Interior, but there are these same types of patterns varying out across other departments as well. Okay. So then the book turns to the question, a question that was unable to be answered with this single time step data of exactly how is Senate confirmation delay impacted by the status quo, the reversion point that's set by the president for those positions to be filled with interim appointees or left empty? And is the Senate relinquishing consent to uh, those positions by not advancing on uh, those nominees that are submitted quickly? And so the, the, this part of the book will ask and answer or tr start to answer the question of how do strategic vacancies interact with the dynamics of the formal confirmation process. It will be able to address those two hypotheses that the previous data wasn't able to address. And then it allows for this examination um, of, of that uh, reversion point, as I mentioned. In addition to that, I've also uh, collected over 230 letters, dear Mr. President letters of senators urging for nominations from the president to kind of get a sense of whether the Senate is simply ignoring the fact that these positions are filled with actings or not do not have a nominee awaiting confirmation. And then also, dear Mr. Chairman letters that are from senators to their respective committee chairs pleading and urging for hearings to be held for the nominations that are technically under consideration. And so here are some examples of these letters. Uh, this letter is uh, to Chairman Mark um, uh, Murkowski, uh, who is uh, the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee with regard to the director of the uh, Bureau of Land Management. If you recall, I, I, I talked about the fact that um, William Pendley was an acting appointee. He also was nominated for the position. And here we have really uh, a clear language from uh, um, nine senators uh, urging the chairman to call a hearing so that they can bring to the American people a an opportunity to hold um, Mr. Pendley to account for his actions as an interim appointee. Similarly, we have these uh, uh, letters from uh, the uh, senators to the president asking for the president to submit nominees for these unfilled positions. These are not just from the more recent administration, uh, the Trump administration, but these go back to George W. Bush and also uh, to Carter as well. So to give you just an example of how it is that the Senate might be relinquishing consent by refusing to advance or reject a nomination, consider the nominee of Susan Combs, who was nominated in July of 2017 for the Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Policy, Management, and Budget. It was stalled by Senate Republicans who fought with Trump over other appointees. The nomination was returned in January 2018 under Senate Rule 31, resubmitted five days later, stalled, returned in 2019 under Senate Rule 31, and then resubmitted 13 days later, only to be confirmed, finally, in June of 2019, almost two years after being submitted. And during that period of time, Combs was appointed as a presidential appointee who could serve then as acting assistant secretary, um, then as acting assist uh, for the position that she was, or for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks from March through August of 2018. And then she also served as Acting Assistant Secretary for Policy Management and Budget from 20, August 2018 until June 2019, all without Senate consent and all while her nominee nomination was sitting in the Senate without being moved on. And so in these cases, the Senate very well may be relinqu relinquishing its consent because it pauses the time frame on which the interims can serve if those nominations are just sitting in the Senate. 
And so I've also engaged in a series, about two dozen uh, interviews with past appointees to offer some qualitative evidence of exactly what was happening during their terms uh, as acting. So here we have a quote from an acting undersecretary of commerce who, who mentions to the fact that there was a political standoff. So a lot of them just had to go in and be acting to deal with the few benefits of that and the few negatives that go along with that. Okay, so then the next part of this book questions how exactly actings are, are, are engaging in their actions when they're filling the positions. And specifically, uh, that there are a variety of actings. There are career actings who are career uh, civil servants who are elevated to that acting position intended to be there for a temporary amount of time versus ones that were appointed as a political appointee and then elevated to the acting status. And so I have sev within these uh, uh, elite interviews, there's qualitative evidence that these are differentiated, not only just within the administrations, but also among the appointees themselves. That there's a big difference between a career leader becoming an acting and a political leader becoming an acting. And that when career appointees are in an acting role, they're expected to be more caretakers. They're not supposed to be policy agenda setters. And, and they, even given that, they're still not excluded from anything. And this was from an interview with a previous acting secretary of labor. Yes, Jeff. Uh, Anne is asking one more question that might sure. be related. Uh, smaller question on DOI. What counts as an acting in your data? Ah, so uh, an official acting stat, so an official acting title, um, uh, if they are uh, uh, filling the position, having been recognized either in uh, congressional testimony, uh, previous federal um, uh, register uh, signatures, um, and the like, as being the acting, that's a, as opposed to performing the duties of the office. So actings are important and they're, they're ultimately, because they are filling these positions without Senate confirmation, they're doing so perhaps in unexpected times. So in, an, in another um, uh, uh, interesting analysis is engaging in a, in a question of how it is that the response to time sensitive crises like epidemics might be impacted by the fact that those positions are filled by acting appointees. And so here we have the distribution of acting appointees in all PAS positions in the dark versus those in PAS positions uh, that are vital to, the pu to a public health crisis response. And we have that as a percentage of the PAS positions in the Department of Health and Human Services. And this is kind of going with the fact that we're still technically in the middle of a pandemic. So it's very interesting to see that it's not the fact that in the middle of a crisis, you had these positions entirely filled with permanent appointees. In fact, actings have a lot of opportunity to impact the government's response to such crises. Okay, so lastly, we get to the Trump acting administration. And here we have uh, a comparison of the fourth year of Obama and Trump's first terms. Uh, so this is for June 20, uh, uh, 2012, not 2016, as the, as the footnote says, but it's actually June 2012, versus June Trump 2020. And as you can see, it's, it is the case that Trump had considerably higher percentages of interim appointees and, and, and empty positions across the departments in his last year of his first term, but he wasn't that different from Obama. And it's not the fact that he is uh, per, perhaps doing something that is brand new, but rather he has just considerably increased the use of interim appointees. And so the book is able to, to identify using this continuous data just how much of an outlier the Trump acting administration is. And so here is a preview of the continuous data across the Trump administration. We have in yellow the position being filled by a confirmed appointee, in blue the position being filled by an interim appointee, and again to Anne's question, this is an official acting uh, 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 designation, whether they were then uh, performing the position, the duties and authorities of the position without that official acting, or if the position was technically empty or listed as vacant. And so here we can see there's a considerable amount of variation across time, across departments, across 
even within departments as to how these positions are filled. And so the book is going to be able to get a better sense of, of what exactly we're looking at, at in terms of the, the outlying nature of the Trump administration. Okay, so I've gone a little bit over time, uh, but some, some concluding thoughts. Um, from, from the first theory, from this new theory that I've presented of presidential appointments, we get a better understanding of pre presidential strategic value and the advantage that they have in the nomination process. We have a more accurate and complete choice set. And, and it all is, is set in this idea that decisions are driven by the position value, by the, the way in which the president and the Senate view that position's capacity to advance their policy priorities. From the new, previously new yearly time step vacancy data, as predicted, we find that the likelihood of interim appointees increases when presidents prioritize expansion for high value positions. And that the FVRA has not discouraged the strategic use of interim appointees as it was intended. And then shifting to the vacancies politics manuscript, we can think through with this new continuous data and offer a more comprehensive analysis. We can examine acting appointee tenure and turnover over the course of these seven administrations. We can examine the impact of that reversion point, whether the position is filled with an interim or not, on confirmation timing to identify just how much the Senate is relinquishing their constitutional prerogative of consent. And we can I then identify the policy implications of these vacancies and presidential appointments. And we can start to answer or even ask again these larger questions of are presidents circumventing confirmation or is the Senate relinquishing consent or is it both? But more importantly, it draws attention to the fact that deliberate sidestepping of formal powers impacts the interbranch bargaining and agenda setting strategies and is something that scholars of political institutions uh, should pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And as I said at the outset, um, we have a formal discussant as we've had this, this whole semester. And today it is my former University of Virginia colleague and Price School alumni, alumna, right? Rachel Augustine Potter, uh, Rachel. All right, well, thank you, Christina. This was awesome. Um, and I want to uh, say at the outset, I'm so excited for this book. Um, so all of these comments are trying to help you think through how you can take this excellent piece of work you have in the APSR and make it an even awesome or just as awesome book. Okay. So for those of you who are tuning in and um, haven't had as much time to brew with this as I have, um, I want to point out just how much of a contribution this is. So um, with the exception perhaps of Anne's work, almost all of the literature on um, vacancy or confirmation politics, I should say, not even vacancies, is, is really about Sen the Senate and the Senate's actions and who the president nominates and do they like the ideology and just glosses over this whole, everything you just learned um, is not treated seriously. And so Christina has done a really great job of identifying this and telling us it matters. It's not just a vacancy. There's these interim positions. There's these empty positions um, and that these are really meaningfully different and that the position value, that's another huge contribution here, that position value really matters, that the president values some positions more than others, which we all have this intuition, but she's done the conceptualize it for us in a really nice way. Um, and they think about how much political capital they're gonna have to expend to get to someone confirmed and whether it's worth it. These are all like kind of like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but Christina is doing all the work for us. And so thank you. Um, okay, so um, um, I'm just uh, thinking about what can I do to help you here? And the thing I wanna tell you most biggest, most biggest of all, um, is that I, you're writing the book that outline that you sent me is a book about vacancy politics. And I think that you're not writing a book about vacancy politics. I think you're writing a book about how the president exercises power in the modern context. And that's a bigger frame. So I want you to go bigger in how you think about this. Um, and I thought of two different ways you could, you could potentially frame this. One is thinking about um, Doug Kreiner and Dino Christensen's recent book, right? They tell us the imperial presidency is a myth, right? That really the public is holding the president accountable, don't worry. You're telling us that article two says 
that the president should get the advice and consent of the president. And the president is regularly flouting that um, and doing it gleefully in some cases and still getting what he wants. Um, that's a really different perspective on how presidents are approaching the world. So is this a book about the imperial presidency? I don't know, um, but it's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is that almost everything we do in executive branch politics, um, the study of executive branch politics focuses on the visible. Let's look at actions that are taken and see what the consequences of them are. And a lot of what you're showing us is what's not taken. So if you're not appointing someone or if you're appointing an interim person and you're not saying it. So I imagine most of these interims are kind of, you're having to dig to even find out who these people were. They're not like a press release that so-and-so is going to be an interim person most of the time. And so this is kind of like, I don't want to call it the hidden politics because that's a little bit overplayed, but the inaction of presidents in a sense is just as important as counting up all these things that we do in all the other contexts. So um, it's a sort of different take on how we study the president and what's important in that. So both of those, I think, take it in sort of like a, a bigger picture context um, that I think you probably want to try to work to incorporate throughout the book, um, even if you choose a, a, another way of of framing it. Okay, um, so that's framing I think is the big um, one. Another thing that was sort of bugging me as I read and, and thought through your presentation today is you're talking about PAS positions, which are so important, but we have other types of positions as Dave Lewis has done you know, a really great job is telling us, think about these Schedule C and these appointed SES positions, they matter and presidents use those. So all I could think of is like, well, how does like having an empty person, an empty position, do you match that with like a lot of Schedule C people to kind of still get what you want? How do these things marry together in terms of getting policy out of an agency? Or are they completely independent? Because when my read on it now is that you're kind of pitching it as completely independent and I'm not sure that they are, but I could be convinced, just tell me how to think. Um, similarly, I thought about recess appointments. So I worked at the Office of Management and Budget before graduate school, and I worked two years under a recess appointee. Um, and, and then she, after her recess time ran up, she got appointed as an interim. Um, so what do we do with that? She served a really long time as a head of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, and had a really significant policy impact. Right now, that's kind of, I, I saw your footnote in the APS, sorry, so don't worry about this, but I'm like, well, I'm worried. So tell me more. And so in a book, I want to see like a lot more of drawing these things out and talking about them as sort of the whole panoply of options um, available to a president and in, in thinking about how to staff up um, the bureaucracy. Okay. Um, I got two more points for you, maybe three. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to pick on you a little bit for something you said in the presentation, which is you said, um, I'm going to talk a lot of, uh, about how this affects separation of powers and interbranch bargaining. And I was like, yes, that's so cool. But I'm not getting a lot of that here. Um, and I'm not sure, like, is there a lot? Is there a there there in the sense of like, so the understanding I have is that the president does these strategies, right? He appoints interims or empties. Um, and the Senate is kind of like, oh, man, right? They can send a letter. But I was like, that's cool data, by the way. But um, what does those, those letters seem like really like not a whole lot of leverage? Um, and then uh, do they like write statutes? Like if we looked at the CF, the way the CFPB, which I know is like a, a controversial one in this context, but it, are there ways ag newer agencies are structured to kind of force presidents in some ways? Is there some way they can institutionally manipulate this? Um, sim similarly with courts, like you have a bit in the Trump chapter you sent about the, the courts responding, but that's very reactive, right? And so I'm like, how is this like affecting, the, I wanna know more, like, so I hope in the book that you can give us a lot more about responses um, and sort of equilibrium outcomes and thinking about what Congress and the courts are gonna do about this. It's not new, as you point out. So like, how have they dealt with this? Like, and, and are they just taking it and accepting it? Or are they happy with it? So a lot more thinking or writing about that, um, I think would be helpful. Okay, and then I do have one, one final point, which is, so 
everyone's going to want to read your Trump chapter, right? That's like <laughs> going to be a really sexy part of this book. And so I wanted to know what, what to think of this chapter. Like, what is the point of telling us about Trump beyond it being really cool data? Um, is it to tell us sort of, is Trump an exception? Um, I think we all kind of expect him to be. So I'm not going to be shocked if your data show us that he's an outlier, but like, can you do more with this instead of, and so what I'm thinking is, first of all, like when you r like frame the chapter, I want to hear a lot more about Trump's attack on the deep state and sort of all of the things. And I'm sure you're going to get there. I know this is like, this is a monster of a project. I completely acknowledge and recognize that. So, so give us a lot more depth on what Trump was doing. People are going to forget by the time I, the publishing book process, as I know well, and political science is long. So by the time your book comes out, people will have like be hazy on the details. And so I wanted to see a lot, a lot more just like fluffiness and making me remember, oh yeah, that was something Trump did. And that applies to her argument in this way. So really giving us depth there. I thought um, your colleagues at Yale have an excellent book that just came out doing a lot of this work for you, right? Um, and I'm referencing here the Skoranek Dearborn King book. Um, so they give you a lot of to work with on sort of how to frame and some good examples um, that you can really build on their argument, right? And thinking about, okay, so what we know about Trump is that he appointed a lot of people that were not particularly qualified for the posts or that were very um, opposed to the mission of the agency. What does that do for your argument? I don't know what to think about. Um, um, I also wanted to know why interior um, I got the sense from this chapter that you're really focusing, you're going to give us a lot of data. Um, and I think that's interesting. Again, I'm probably not going to be surprised by anything your data shows. So I would say um, if it, just my inclination is, yeah, show us the data, show us a lot of descriptive analyses, but give us a lot of examples. So one thing I am hoping to get out of the book is how this, can these people, one criticism could be like, yeah, they put these empty or these interims, but they don't do much. And you're kind of saying, no, they matter a lot. So give us the qualitative stuff, like the moving of the Bureau of Land Management to Colorado. Like give it, you have one paragraph on that, like give me like 10 pages on that. Like, and how the interim um, interacts with that, or they, I can't remember. Um, but just a lot more of those kinds of things that really, oh, here's something you really thought mattered that happened at an agency under Trump. And it was done by this kind of person. It wasn't somebody who the Senate okayed. Um, so I think that would be rather than, you know, having, you know, your 70th, it feels like you have a lot of data in this book, but like analysis, like give us a lot more of the stuff that is going to help us put a frame on why we should care about this. Like why do people who don't normally pay attention to appointments want to pay, start paying attention to this strategy that's happening? But um, that's what I've got for you. I can send you, I see you taking notes. I can um, send you some notes, um, but, um, but I really am, like I said, this is an awesome project and I'm happy to have an early sneak peek into what you're doing. So before we we go to questions, do you want to respond, Christina, to some of the things that she that I Rachel mean, mentioned? First, I mean, like Rachel, like this is this is just fantastic. Thank you. Um, you know, Rachel. Rachel is a, uh, a, a Chuck Shippen student, as I am, as a sister uh, in in academia, and uh, just produces. Stellar, stellar stuff. Her award-winning book is amazing. So any, you know, uh, uh, advice from you, I, I take with uh, uh, very important details. And I would really like it if I, I'm glad that this is recording because I'd really like it if I could get your notes. Um, but um, to your point, uh, there's there's a couple parts um, with the Schedule C thing. I get, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, to be honest, it's more along the lines of I'm only one human. And as, as much as I desperately want to explain all of it, I just like, yeah, I, I can't, but I definitely, I think that you're right. I think that there's, you know, um, there are these kind of side routes that are happening, uh, that are working both in tandem, potentially against, uh, the flow of, of how an acting is impacting the actions of the agency, um, that are, that are, you know, from those, you know, those additional 4,000 positions that the president can put in, uh, and in these areas. So I, I, I take your point and I, I definitely think that it's something, um, 
uh, in terms of the recess appointments, yes, I have, I have that I, I'm, I'm getting more into that. Um, I have all of those identified right now. I'm, I'm treating them as official because I'm not technically acting as like the acting official. But I think that that definitely, I think you're right. I think that there is a difference between recessed uh, appointees. Um, and then uh, to this more qualitative part, um, I, I appreciate that because I have hundreds of pages that I've written um, that I thought no one would be inter not no one, but like that was just too many examples and and that perhaps uh, the the num letting the numbers speak for themselves. Um, but I think uh, I think that that you know with your encouragement, I think that I definitely will integrate more. I have a lot and and the reason for interior is mostly um, because there's a lot of consequential decisions and I like it because Generally, people don't think about interior when they, they think it's kind of like a, you know, like a throwaway department, like, oh, no one cares about interior, but like there's so much there and there's so many really consequential actions that interior takes that are challenged in courts that uh, have really meaningful impact for states and state governments and for local communities. And um, I mean, I didn't even, uh, uh, I haven't really even gotten deeply into the, like the tribal um, community aspect of this. And the fact, you know, like there's just, um, so that was why with interior, I know it's like kind of like most people are like, oh, interior, it's not as sexy as like defense or state or something, but, um, or DHS, but I feel like, um, that's, that's why. And, and I definitely, uh, I, I take your point on the, on the examples. I have a lot more. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the different forms that we have here. Um, so Brian Feinstein is here. Um, he asked a question that he thinks maybe Rachel's, one of Rachel's points got to, but let me ask it anyway. Uh, is there any way to assess the policy output of agencies helmed by a permanent versus non-permanent agency heads? And I think, uh, you know, Rachel talked about, you know, some of the policy case studies you could do. Is there anything more systematic though than that? So, so yes, certainly. So actually um, uh, another, uh, 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 kind of part of in the in the actings uh, chapter I'm working on is looking more at the Department of Labor with the um, uh, enforcements, the investigations and enforcements that they can engage in, um, that various sub bureaus can engage in, uh, the Wage and Hour Administrator, um, uh, Assistant Secretary for OSHA. Um, uh, so not only. Uh, in, in terms of enforcement, as in, um, you know, going like seeing that they have their regional civil servants out there engaging in actions, but also um, that there is movement towards facilitating new regulations if necessary uh, to, to deal with um, uh, you know, policy problems as they, as they arise. And so those kinds of metrics are available and I, I am starting to kind of work through them and, and, but I'm happy to take suggestions of, 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 of perspectives because it's very much is a, a work in, in progress. Let me, let me go ahead and ask a, a um, Sorry, these are, there's a lot of different windows you can go to. Yeah, there are a lot of different things there. Let me ask a simple question. And that is, you know, as you were sitting down to think about, uh, the research design and putting your data together. Why did you start in 1977? Is there a, is there a reason for that? Was it just pragmatic? That was where, uh, when I was in the middle of collecting my dissertation research uh, or starting my dissertation research, um, the collection point was the beginning of a uh, administration. Um, I, I wanted a little bit, uh, I wanted to have at least two administrations on the before side of the 1988 uh, reform. Um, I, I would have loved to have collected farther back than 1977, um, but I didn't want to just start with Reagan because I felt that um, that would put, you know, that we needed a little bit more variation in both uh partisanship, but then also, per, you know, kind of like the, the posture that the president was taking um, uh, to, uh, with regard to, to government and to, to like their, their role as the chief executive. And so I wanted to have that. So that's where that started. Do you have any, any hunches about how Nixon behaved or any of the prior administrations? Um, I, I, I'm going to, I really, I, I have hunches, but they're not well supported and they're like one-offs. Um, uh, you know, Nixon certainly put act, had acting officials in his position in, you know, a few of his positions. Um, 
you know, I just really don't have a good sense of, of before 1977. I just don't. Yeah. The, only, the only reason I would think about it is that most of the time period you have is, is you know, to some, de- to some degree polarized, right? I mean, we talk about polarization starting with the Reagan, uh, even, even at the end of the Carter administration, if you're thinking just in terms of Congress, right? And if you, if you were to go back and you were to clone yourself and there would be several of you, right? I just wonder if, 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 you, if, you, if one were to tackle the pre-polarized era, what things would look like then? And, and you know, were, were the norms different? at all in the way that you would think about filling these sorts of things? Yeah, that's a really good question. And definitely one I think that I would, I would be really, I'm, I'm very interested in, you know, the, the way that presidents have used appointees, um, you know, and, and the way that they, that that relationship has evolved, uh, particularly with regard to the Senate and deference to the Senate and various, you know, ways in which we've, um, you know, the things we kind of take for granted now in terms of um, in terms of that negotiation. But I, yeah, I, I think that that's definitely <laughs> buck number two. <laughs> I mean, is it, is it reasonable to think about, think that the period you have is a, is a normal period is one normal period? You know, I, I mean, like if I'm, if I'm, if I'm really on it, like I'm, I'm mostly interested in the modern, in, in the modern time right now, because the world has gotten so much more complex. We have more departments than we did prior to Carter. We have um, more policy areas in which, you know, there are real and 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 concerning questions that government has to make actions on. And the, you know, it makes these positions even more important, particularly for guiding those actions. And as we see, you know, more crises or more like more time sensitive things that seem to kind of come up as our world is almost sped up in, in time. Um, I, my, you know, like I'm, that's where, that's where like I definitely draw, uh, my, my heart is drawn to. Okay. Uh, Brian wrote in a response to your response. Uh, he says, those metrics sound sensible. Regarding other suggestions, I suppose the Holy Grail is a cross-agency productivity measure. Perhaps QuantGov's measures of pages, point numbers of regulated, okay. <laughs> pages, point numbers of, of regs per agency year would be valid. Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely. I mean, you know, the the number of of regulations and uh, like Rachel has uh, her previous work on OIRA, thinking through like that kind of level of productivity, um, or or that that metric of productivity. I think is is a really interesting one and one that I I definitely should should spend some more time with. Let's go back to uh, Anne's first question here because it was a, a bit of a longer one and we didn't want to break up the whole talk. Uh, when she when she asks what percentage of vacant jobs does the president actually have a choice to fill, she then goes on to say, on the interim side, if there is a first assistant to the PAS job, that person has to be the acting acting under the Vacancies Act. Do you think that this matters at all for what you're doing? The fact that there are these kind of circuit breakers in place. I mean, is well, that just a deeper game in some I mean, ways? Well, so the the per I mean, like Anne is definitely the the expert on this, and I wish that there was some way to engage with her. I guess we'll engage tomorrow. But um, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, I I think that the you know the question of the first assistant having to be acting. Um, the president can, I'm, my understanding is, can ch- can choose to replace that person um, under the FVRA and with someone else uh, who who is, you know, meeting the qualifications um, outside of the first assistant. Oh, there's Anne. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, hi, Anne. <laughs> So there's definitely some time to engage here. So feel free to kind of engage. Can, can I just interject a bit, Christina? Sure, um, absolutely. So I think you can do some of this by level of position, because of course, for really high level Senate confirmed positions, the first assistant uh, is also a Senate confirmed person, right? The first yes. assistant to the secretary is the deputy secretary. Yes. Um, and even when they're not Senate confirmed for top positions, the first assistant is often political, but for lower level Senate confirmed positions, that's not true. So inspectors general, for example, the yes. first assistant to the IG, and those are long standing vacant positions, yes. um, is the principal deputy IG, which is, 
I think almost always a career person. So you can't just kind of get rid of them. So there's kind of two questions. There's like, do you get rid of the first assistant and have no one? Or do you not get rid of the first assistant, but you choose one of those two alternatives under the Vacancies Act? Um, and I'm starting to look at that because the, the, that requires presidential action. That's not just the presidential personnel office. The president has to sign a document to choose yes. a non-first assistant. And so, and we saw some of that in the Trump administration, right? In fact, we saw that with IGs, right? Firing the IGs, not letting the career deputy IG come in, instead choosing a political person at the State Department. Yes. Education Department. So I think there's some really interesting political questions there too. There and is. I get the sense that there was more of that kind of political strategy in the Trump administration than in previous administrations. I I, I would I would agree um, uh, with with your point, Anne, and I um, look forward to talking with you more <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> and, and offline because um, there's yes there's there's so much nuance and um, and it's always fun. I mean, like it's fun to have Anne. It's fun to have have Rachel as well because it's you know these are these are questions that I think Trump has definitely shined a light on, but there have been a, a, a select few of us who have been really interested in these things from the very beginning, and it's really. Um, you know, the, the, the ability for these chess, you know, type uh, uh, movements around the board, depending on who is filling what position, you know, delegating someone, we, we saw all of, um, I, I don't know if anyone's followed uh, the DHS uh, court cases, but there's a whole, you know, there's a three page um, uh, uh, trans, you know, kind of walking through exactly how this person was put in in the assistant, uh, you know, uh, as assistant secretary position, so that they could be deputy secretary, so that they could be secretary, and so there's a lot of opportunity for the president. So I think, yeah, and you're right. I I think there's a lot of places to to continue to look for for those those actions. Okay, so we we have a couple minutes left. I, I was just wondering if you would want to speak a little bit to what your book. What do you think your book is going to look like? You know, just the, the breakdown a little bit for the audience out here. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the book is aiming to get at uh, the questions that my research previously couldn't answer because of limited data. I wasn't really able to dive deeply into um, what happens when a nominee uh, is submitted, how long does it take the president to submit a nominee, how long does it take the Senate to confirm a nominee, and, and all the while with this reversion point occurring, that status quo continuing, there is still, especially if there's a person serving or serving in multiple positions, another place that I'm, you know, I'm hoping to kind of draw in is the fact that uh, by having acting appointees serving in multiple positions, perhaps um, in a, a, a political appointee position that's, you know, in the SES, and then as an acting, and then as another acting, um, I'm thinking of people like like Mulvaney, who, you know, they're serving in places where you're supposed to have a singular full-time individual. And so ultimately they're going to have their, their attention pulled apart and there's going to be opportunities um, for, for actions to happen that perhaps are intended, unintended. Um, but all of this is, is aiming towards providing a more comprehensive uh, uh, analysis of how both the president and the Senate are are dealing with this, and and whether the Senate is engaging in the kinds of things that Rachel brought up in her comments, um, you know, in writing in uh, or or proposing new legislation to to reform the FVRA, taking into consideration these kinds of moves, how the courts are responding to this, how they void certain actions based off of the legalities around an appointee's uh, uh, acting status. Um, and so really trying to get a, a much better handle on this, on this route outside of the formal nomination confirmation process, which we've spent so much time looking at. And, and there's this, you know, if we're really concerned about how government is functioning, about the, the actual, you know, when the rubber hits the road and, the, and, and you know, the actual things that, that these individuals are engaging in, um, when they're, you know, leading administrations, when they're leading their own agencies or their sub-agencies, um, Ultimately, we can't wait. We can't wait for a Senate confirmed appointee, and we can't only pay attention to them because there's a lot of hot stuff happening in the meantime. So the the interviews that you're doing, what what is the 
I mean, how do you see those as buttressing what you're doing? Is this a little external validity? Is this simply shining a light on some of the quantitative work? How are you imagining you're going to integrate that into the actual book? So uh, exactly, as you said, a little bit of external validity, um, you know, kind of, um, so I interviewed uh, a little over two dozen uh, previous acting appointees um, uh, who served in uh, a whole host of positions from Carter through Trump in a variety of um, departments from uh, acting secretaries, deputy secretaries, general counsels, assistant secretaries, commissioners, and really to, um, to get a sense as to not only uh, the external validity of the assumptions that I made in my theory, but also to get a sense of the experience of, of the human that is operate, who that is, you know, actually filling that seat. Um, uh, again, you know, kind of thinking through the fact that an empty position doesn't have a person to reach out to, but this acting uh, uh, appointee uh, would have experienced uh, either being excluded or included or feeling constrained or not constrained, um, feeling as though their, you know, political, their, their civil service career has been um, uh, entirely derailed because they spent too long of time in an acting position and became associated as a political appointee in that, you know, for that administration, even though they weren't, even though they were technically a career civil servant. Um, thinking through how, uh, when they are actings um, in a time when they could also be nominated, which was prior to the NLRB SW general decision, you know, that the, the, that, that process through which they're engaging in both, perf you know, being in the position that they're that they're going to potentially be nominated for, and having conversations with senators about, um, you know, what uh, you know what their role in the department will be, what they see their role being throughout that confirmation process, and so um, it's really hoping to to bring some some depth and some some better understanding to um, to to more than just the numbers on the page. Thanks very much. For, for, for presenting. Uh, thanks very much to Rachel for discussing. Thanks very much to the people out there who uh, attended, some of whom asked some good questions. Uh, this will be up and available for you in about a week or so. Uh, it'll be up on YouTube so the world can see you. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. Uh, but thanks very much for participating today. And I, and I clipped some of the comments of the chat into an email and I'll send that to you as Thank well. you. Just Thank so, you guys so much for case, having me. This was, in case this you was miss great. It. Thank uh, you. But thanks again and have a good rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Rachel, so much. Thank you. And thanks, Anne. Yeah, thanks to <laughs> Anne and Aubrey, as always. <laughs>